trading uh, this backward D pawn for that C pawn. So now black is sitting comfortable for the moment with his knight on C7 that can eventually go to E6. And importantly, black is stopping white from going D4 anytime soon. And so it's going to be a slow kind of methodical game here where both sides are trying to build up a plan. From white's perspective, you're trying to break through a D4 at the right moment. Again, it's very, very difficult with this the pawn structure being e5, c5, knight on c6. Um, this is why a move like a3 is played, hopefully, hoping to eventually play uh, b4. That doesn't look very plausible, but also stopping the knight from going to b4 uh, to be a nuisance on the white queen. So if I'm if I'm black here, I consider a variety of moves. Well, bishop e6 is the most natural. I was going to say g6 uh, can sometimes be uh, considered to put that bishop on f5. But again, black is doing very well here, very comfortable. And so, um, you know, I think that Grishuk is should be very happy with his current position. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's the kind of Maroxy bind you normally see with white, uh, where with the colors reversed, right? White having this type of structure, uh, the Maroxy bind, everyone being this pawn structure here, where black has more space, and uh, as long as you can keep control over these breaks d4 and b4, you're usually happy um, with the person. Well, on, on the normally I, I would say it's the white side of a Maroxy bind structure, but this is for black. Uh, but that's exactly what Magnus is going to try to do, right? You're going to see... I, I wonder, if, is Knight A5 a shot that is potentially coming here from Black? Sorry, I had to say that before I finished the instructional point, which is that White's going to... Magnus is going to try to maneuver his pieces and get in a position to make a strike of either D4 and B4, because that's the kind of thing that liberates the, the, the pieces behind the pawns. But Or not, or he's going for a different idea where he wants to highlight the other weakness in a Maroxy bind, which is potentially this D5 outpost square. Uh, I think bishop c4 was almost more defensive-minded, though, Robert, to stop threats of this move knight a5 coming in to gang up on the b3 pawn. Right. I mean, knight a5 was an interesting shot there. I'm curious to, to know what the players thought about that. But um, you know, the good move by Grishuk is he's you know, he's hoping that white will take on, on e6, the knight then from c7 will capture an e6, and once more g4 stop. But if I'm white... Again, it's important to know when to release the tension. Leave it for now. Go knight e2. That way you threaten the pawn on e5. Um, you try to go d2 to d4 and blast open the center, particularly because the rook on d1 is staring down a queen on d8. It's always good for the side with the rook. And so, um, you know, from Black's perspective, I would have preferred at some point to have gone f7, f5, which would have allowed um, Black to try to push forward in the center with e5 and e4. Now I think knight e2... And it's, the position is definitely turning in White's favor. Yeah, if knight e2 forces a move, um, well, okay, f6 isn't even possible because the bishop is hanging. But no, even it's if, not hanging. Knight on c7. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, duh. Okay, I need, need a little more coffee here. But yeah, in, in fact, uh, the main but the main drawback of f6 is it's you know black is passively now having to defend this extended center, which you don't really want to be doing the Maroxy bind. And as Robert said, if White can strike with d4. Usually, white's pieces are a little more ready for the open lines that are about to happen as the pawns start getting traded in the center. So, um, Magnus taking his sweet time here. Wow! And then plays a move Whoa. on the other side of the board that we didn't see coming. So, Honey Badger doesn't care about the H pawn. What if Black just what goes and I, takes the H pawn? I was just saying Bishop G four here, right? Because you know, I, what, you can't take the H pawn. I would be uh, very hesitant before capturing it. But my thought is, okay, bishop g4, uh -huh. that way I'm pinning your knight on f3, uh -huh. so you can't go knight g5. And the whole idea from white's perspective is to get the two bishops even at the cost of a pawn. So if I go bishop g4, well, you're not moving that knight, because knight g5, I capture knight g5, and then take on d1, that's a free exchange. And so bishop g4, maybe queen to e4, but then queen d7, and now f5 is a huge threat. This pin on the f3 knight is still quite frustrating to deal with, so uh, from my point of view here, I think bishop g4 is just great for black. Yeah, I don't understand uh, what Magnus was thinking about h4. It feels a little reckless for white, uh, especially given the knight e2 and, and going for the more traditional plan. But but again, Grishuk, not looking for aggressive shots, doesn't find this opportunity to go for something different. Uh, and, and now we see the reason why that h-pawn is rushing up the board. It's going to be uh, going to be kamikaze here. It's probably going to try to just get that pawn to h6 and do whatever you can to open up counterplay against the black king. Although after h6, like, black could probably just capture on h6 and then try to use the g-file yeah, for his benefit. Right. And I think Grishik's going to do exactly that. The bishop on c4 guards g8 as it currently stands, but but uh, I still... You know me, I'm 
I'm happy to sacrifice in exchange by going queen d7. Next move, rook g8. You can capture me all you want. I'll take yep. back with the rook. Not yep. to mention that f5, no, not f5 now because the, the diagonal is open, but uh, bishop f5 might be a, a bit of an annoying threat in the near future. So um, knight e8 to d6 is another perfectly reasonable idea. That I think black has to be extremely careful about allowing this knight on c3 to move as you just spend knight b5, because uh -huh. then sacrifice on e5 could be deadly at some moment with the bishops um, just really uh, raking on the open board. But, yeah, it's an unclear position to be sure. So knight takes b5, bishop b5, uh, for example. Yeah, th this could be really funny, right? You start to have fantasies of the bishop uh, and knight and everybody coming together on e5, you know, um, the kind of fantasies you usually have, sacrifices <laughs> on e5. Yeah, I mean, but I guess if you're from Black's perspective, you know that's an, uh, in, in the cards, right? You have to be cognizant of that sacrifice, but don't be afraid of it. Be objective. Knight takes b5, bishop takes b5, go bishop f5. Right, or even, even still, bishop f5 now. I mean, you've mentioned it before, and I don't usually like repeating the things you say, but I agree. It puts the queen on an awkward square, and I feel like Black is, is maybe even there capable of playing a move like Druk g8 because the potential compensation on this uh, open file when the light square bishop is gone could be really big for black. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think bishop f5, queen square. The reason why I take on b5, and okay, now I'll go bishop f5. So I, okay, queen e6. I, okay, decent move for sure. Uh, I would have preferred bishop f5, rook g8, but I guess um, Grishuk is trying to go rook g8 at some point, but now rook g8 always runs into bishop c4. So um, I think black is still doing well because white has to prove the compensation yes that the extra pawn is a weird double h pawn yeah but this time okay now that the queens come off the board i, wow. I don't think uh, black is doing two points queen takes b3 i was wondering if queen takes b3 could have been a shot there yeah by black it, um magnus sort of pushing all the right buttons even if some of these moves are not the not the best objective moves magnus is creating a practical scenario where this king is now a sitting duck to the bishop on the diagonal. These doubled h pawns are nobody's favorite. Um, suddenly, I, I I'm starting to get this weird creeping feeling that the position's going to open up and Magnus is going to have devastating tricks on the long diagonal and the open e file. I'm not sure if if Grishik got everything he could have out of that position. Right, and I still would say that Black should be better here because yeah, you're up two pawns, and more importantly. You're up a two, well, three on two from the D to A files, but likely if that pawn captures on C5, then you're up two to one on the queen side. And um, if white's attack fizzles out, and right now the attack is only with his bishop on B2, so, I mean, I guess knight D2 is an op option here for white. Knight D2 to... and knight E4 is an interesting one I was looking at because you hit the bishop, everybody, and then you try to bring this knight to E4 where, where they can gang D5. up together on F6. But wow, Magnus is. Okay, d5 must have the intention if bishop takes to play a move like rook to d1, sacrificing another pawn just to eliminate black's bishop pair. Um, I just, but it, it I does. Mean, it feels a little bit like like Magnus is really playing overly aggressive chess here. You know, trying to trying to uh, play the big stack, trying to push push the table around here. I, d I don't know exactly what what he's calculating with d5. Okay, and, and I think this is a smart decision by Grisha because. Maybe not even a go for tactics on the D file, simplify it out. Because at the end, as you already said, black has this three on, on one over here on the queen side. Going to have a big advantage in the end game. And that C pawn is looking more and more dangerous for black every second. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was expecting this exchange sacrifice, but I think it's a bluff. I think it's sort of out of desperation in the fact that, well, black was doing quite well. If you take it on E5 with the bishop and the rook, that C pawn was running to the board very quickly. Yep. And now it's an exchange up. There's no check on the diagonal. You know, if the bishop was gone from b3, the bishop c4 check would be a huge threat. But now it's kind of, I don't know, I think it's, like I said, it's bluffing. Rook e3 to rook g3 is now a threat. Or is it? Can the black king then escape king f7 to e6? Yep. Right? So it's kind of a lot of hopeful chess from yep. Magnus' point of view. And from Grishuk's point of view, it's, well, I'm up in exchange. I have this past c pawn. And so a move here like, I don't know, king f7. Right, just bring well, the king, king of seven might allow g4. That would have been the trap that Magnus was looking for, right? Say goodbye to the rook, so. Ah, well, that's true. I guess I was going to take on e5 and then put my king on e6. And again, my queenside pass pawns are, at least from my point of view, are, are superior to the, the things going on in the center. But it's, it is a tricky position. I, I don't think we should dismiss white's chances completely. But I think black, I mean, black should just eventually just push forward 
over there on the queen side. So yeah, I agree. I, I I think it's strange. We don't normally speak in these terms, right? Using a lot of poker terminology. Magnus sort of bluffing, maybe overplaying his hand a little bit. But the position has felt very much like Magnus was forcing dynamic uh, dynamic tactics and. Uh, Grishik seems to have parried all the issues up to this point, but time pressure is real, and we know that uh, Grishik with only 16 seconds is is going to be nervous here. I think this is going to be one of the things that decides today, Robert, whether Grishik can make an upset, can pull the upset and win this match. Is going to be how he handles moments right here, right now. Like this moment here, he's winning, but now there goes the clock, there goes the time, right? I mean, this is exactly the kind of issue that I think... Uh, Grishik will be facing against Magnus. It's it's the Mikel Tal thing, right? It's Magnus bringing the practical pressure, even though objectively Black should be just fine here. This looks this is looking scarier and scarier now. Right. You never want to see a bishop on e5 with a bare Black King on g, especially with a rook on the seventh rank. Yep. But again, it, it kind of appears just to be a check. And right. so if you know, but like you said, Dan, the time situation is really bad for Grishik and continues to be. And so he made an inaccuracy with rook takes d7. If he taken d7 with the bishop, he would have been in a perfectly good shape. And even yep. still here, he should be all right. But, I mean, it has to favor white considering yep. the time situation. And you're right. Back in that critical moment, we saw that Magnus, you know, his sixth sense or whatever, he played this move d7, everybody, right, when Grishik didn't have much time. You can see on the analysis board, and that's what got Sasha to take with f6, and the f7 check is coming, right? Yeah. Rookie seven check, king d8, f7, game over. And, and, uh, and already Magnus does what he does best. He just swindled his way to a victory based mainly on the fact that Grishuk didn't have enough time to solve the issues, that uh, to solve the landmine of tricks that Magnus laid out. So, you know, Robert, talking a little bit, so apply, give, give some of your advice here to the, uh, to the fans, and wh how do you handle moments like that psychologically? You know your opponent is playing something that's unsound. Should Grishik have just trusted his intuition and just taken the palm with the bishop and say, prove it? Or do you have to try to solve the tactics there? To, I mean, we see Magnus basically working it, right? He's working his mojo against Grishik in games where he shouldn't be winning. So how, how do you deal with that? Well, I think one of the things to say is it's easier sometimes to be on a losing or much worse side of a game because when you're better, you're trying to think, how do I convert this? How do I make right. sure that I don't slip up and let my opponent back in the game? So from Magnus' point of view, his actual game plan was easy. He had a bishop on e5. He's like, hopefully I can just push forward and start attacking the king. And then he went d7.